Okay, I think we'll start. Um, so thank you everyone for attending this talk. Uh, this talk's about SD cards, uh, why they wear out, and what you can do to improve the life and performance. Uh, my name's Andrew Murray, and I work for The Good Penguin. We're a embedded Linux consultancy, and uh, we help Linux uh, customers get Linux on their devices. Uh, but in, through doing this work, we often get customers come to us and complain about uh, the apparent unreliability of SD cards. Um, and some of these complaints might include just general data corruption, perhaps a file system gets corrupt unexpectedly, uh, but also errors seen in kind of D-message as shown here. Um, the other type of issue we see is customers cl complaining about uh, poor performance. So perhaps they buy an SD card and uh, the manufacturer says it can do 20 megabytes a second write speed, but they find that in actual use they don't get anywhere near that performance. Um, and finally, and by far the most common complaint is SD cards not lasting as long as people might expect. Um, and that can often be quite a problem if your device is booting from an SD card because when the SD card stops working, you can't remotely update it um, and you have to uh, kind of return it back to the manufacturer. Um, so we thought it'd be useful to take a closer look at SD cards uh, to try and understand uh, what's going on here and uh, to give some uh, better advice to our customers. Um, so if we take a typical SD card, I say typical, but this is actually one I found um, in my attic. It's uh, from 2007. I hope to uh, find some photos of me at university on there, but as it turns out, and quite fit into this presentation, uh, it was corrupt. So the passage of time um, didn't do it uh, justice. But if we take the lid off, um, you can see some SD card connectors at the top. They obviously mate the SD card with the, um, the PC or the SD card reader. And the chip at the bottom is a flash memory chip, and that is where all your data is stored. The bit in between is um, an SD controller. It's a microcontroller, and that's really important. And what that does is it, um, it translates requests from the host that uh, adhere to the kind of SD specification, and it relays those uh, to NAND commands. And it also does some other really important jobs that take care of managing the life of, of the NAND chip. But the thing about uh, flash memory is that this, this chip here is of type NAND, and NAND memory is inherently unreliable. Uh, but despite that, it's used everywhere. And it's used everywhere because it's cheap. Um, we see it in things like EMMC. We see it in SSDs and USB mass storage devices. Um, but we don't often associate unreliability with things like SSDs. And that's not because the, the fundamental NAND chip is different. It's because of how that NAND chip's used. So perhaps in an SSD, there's a bit more redundancy. Uh, there's cache. There's uh, different electronics. Um, but Fundamental to all of this is, is the root of your storage is unreliable NAND. Um, I did actually find a newer SD card, um, but I took the lid off and there really wasn't much inside, uh, much to my surprise. Um, but there is this kind of block at the top uh, that has everything in it. it, has the contacts on the outside. Um, but inside it'll still have kind of NAND chip and it'll still have some kind of microcontroller. Um, now, in order to really understand uh, why SD cards uh, can wear out. Uh, we need to understand the kind of building block of NAND memory, which is uh, the humble silicon transistor. Um, I'm not an electronics person, so uh, please forgive me if you are, uh, but I hope uh, the analogies will help explain how, how this works. Uh, this is a type of transistor called a MOSFET, a metal oxide semiconductor field effect uh, transistor. And basically it's just a switch. Um, current will only flow between source and drain if voltage is applied to the control gate. The control gate is a switch, and when you press it, current flows. Um, now, this transistor is built on silicon. The silicon isn't really a great conductor. Um, so in order to make the switch, um, the manufacturers will inject some impurities into the silicon in, in certain parts. And by injecting impurities, you can um, control or change the conductivity properties of the material. So around the source and the drain, um, they dope it, they inject um, an impurity such as phosphorus. And, and what's special about that is compared to silicon atoms, it has an extra electron in its outer shell. And that extra electron can be used to carry current. It's, it's not tied to any kind of bonds. Um, and we call that N-type doping. Um, and I've represented it here with lots of happy electrons that are free to move around. Um, the remainder of the substrate is uh, P-type doped. And that's typically... Um, um, has an impurity such as uh, boron, um, and that takes the opposite approach. So compared to silicon, it has one less electron in its outer shell. Um, and that actually still improves conductivity because what it does is in the lattice of um, silicon atoms, uh, there's now a gap where 
uh, there's no bond. And that gap creates a hole, and electrons can jump from hole to hole. Um, but compared to the n-type, it's not uh, as good a conductor. And I represented that with um, holes or circles. Now, the interesting thing about this is on the boundary between the n and the p-type, um, the electrons from the n-type drift across into the p-type layer and fill those holes. Um, and the problem with that is it creates what, what's known as a depletion um, area. Uh, it's a depletion area because the electrons that are in the holes can't be used to carry charge because they're, they're more stable um, holding that bond. And where they've come from, there's no electrons there anymore. Um, so it acts as a kind of a boundary where electrons can't pass through very easily. Um, and the effect of that is that this switch is off. Uh, current isn't flowing. Uh, but if you apply uh, voltage to the control gate, um, if you uh, apply what's known as the threshold voltage, you can turn the transistor on. And the way it does this is um, as voltage goes on the control gate, um, uh, electrical charge is built up. It acts like a capacitor because you have this oxide layer that's an insulator. And that uh, draws the electrons towards it uh, and gives it the energy. Um, and the effect of that is this depletion layer moves down. And what you see is you now get a channel of electrons that can be used to conduct current. So as long as you apply a, a threshold voltage to the control gate, then magically current can now flow your transistors on. Um, so that's a, a kind of a basic MOSFET transistor. And a NAND cell is very similar to this, um, except we call it a floating gate MOSFET. And the difference is this extra kind of sandwich in between where we have an additional uh, uh, conductive layer called a floating gate, um, and it's sandwiched in with uh, insulators all around. Um, and the really interesting thing about the floating gate is that's where your data is stored. Uh, if there's electrons on that floating gate, then we say the uh, NAND cell is erased and the, the cell has a, a logic value of one. Whereas if there's no electrons on that floating gate, then we say the cell is programmed and it has a, a value of zero. Um, so literally your precious data is electrons trapped on a, a floating gate somewhere, uh, which I find quite interesting. So how do you program the NAND? If, if, there's, if this floating gate is surrounded by an insulator, how do you get the electrons on or off that? Uh, well, you do that by applying a much larger voltage at the control gate. Um, and this uses um, a quantum effect that I don't understand called Fowler, Nordheim, Tunneling and um, due to the magic of quantum mechanics, electrons magically can pass across the insulator onto the, um, the floating gate. So you apply a large voltage to the control gate and electrons move onto that floating gate. And now this uh, NAND cell has a kind of logic value of one. If you do the reverse and you put a negative voltage on the control gate, the opposite happens and the electrons are drawn back into the subtrate, um, given your floating gate and this NAND cell a value of uh, zero. So at this point, we've been able to program and erase our NAND cell. But how do you read the data on that? How do you know if there's electrons on that floating gate or not? Well, we have to remember that this is still a transistor and it still operates as a switch. Um, but the interesting thing is the electrons on the floating gate, because they're negatively charged, they kind of interfere with the, the, the electric fields produced by the control gate. So when you apply um, the threshold voltage on the control gate, if there's electrons on the floating gate, the transistor won't turn on. So the effect of the electrons is that the, the more electrons on that gate, the higher the threshold voltage needs to be. Um, and you can come up with like this kind of graph where the more electrons there are, the higher the threshold voltage has to be. So with this in mind, it's quite easy to say, well, I'll set a threshold voltage. And if I want, when I want to read the NAND, I'll uh, apply the voltage to the gate. And if the transistor turns on, then I know there was no electrons on the gate. If it doesn't turn on, I know that there must be electrons on the gate, which meant that the, the voltage I applied wasn't high enough. Um, and this is the principle behind a uh, single uh, layer um, uh, NAND, uh, where you have one bit of information on a floating gate transistor. Um, but manufacturers trying to improve the density of NAND chips, they decided it doesn't need to be binary all electrons, all NAND, and actually it's, it's an analog value. So perhaps you could say, well, if there's some electrons on, we'll have a different uh, logic value. Um, and that's exactly what they've done. And to read um, uh, a floating gate that has, say, two bits of data per cell, you, you have to, to read the data, you, um, you apply a voltage. If the transistor doesn't turn on, you apply a slightly higher voltage. And by doing so, you can determine um, up to say, in this case, four values. Now, the floating gate uh, transistor isn't just used for NAND. It's also used for NOR. 
uh, but the difference is, is how they're connected. And in the case of NAND, they're connected in series. So the drain from one transistor connects to the source of the next, and you form these long strings of um, transistors. But the organization creates a really significant side effect. So um, we know that, or the side effect is that you can only read and write in a granularity of a page size, which might be something like 32 kilobytes. Um, and when you write, all you can do is you can change the, the, the one bits into zero bits. But to go the other way around and to turn zeros back into ones, you have to erase the page. But due to the organization, you can't erase the page. You have to erase a whole collection of page, which we call a block. Uh, so you can write in a smaller granularity than you can erase. Um, so to illustrate this, I've drawn, say, uh, a block of NAND pages. Um, I've colored them green to show that they're, they're erased. Um, and let's say that we want to program this and we write something to each one of those pages. So now we've used up our NAND and it's completely full. But what happens if we want to, say, change the data on the first page? How do we do that? Well, we're in a bit of a bind here because we can't, because in order to change the data, we have to erase that page first, but we can't. We have to instead erase the entire block. But the problem is that block has pages with data we want to keep. So a simple way to do this might be to make a note of all the pages that you do want to keep, um, mark the uh, old pages not needed. Now you can erase the whole block. You can put the data back, including your changed data. Um, now clearly that works, but it's not very efficient because we wanted to write one page of data, but in order to do that, we actually wrote nine pages because we had to write the eight that were previously there and the one that's changed. Um, and when this happens, we call this a write amplification effect, where the host has to do one thing, but in order to achieve that, the underlying SD card controller has to do many more writes on the NAND. Uh, but clearly, this will be slower because you're doing more work. And as NAND um, has a limited life, this will obviously use that a lot quicker. Um, so a more sensible approach would be to, to make those changes out of place. So when you want to change, for example, page A, you could just change it, put it on a new freshly erased block um, instead. Um, so effectively we have a kind of a log based flash translation layer here and we now have to keep a map in between the kind of logical blocks that the, the host is saying they want to write to and we have to know where in the NAND that is. Um, and this works really well. Um, but over time, as you keep replacing pages, you end up with this kind of mismatch of, of pages, some that aren't needed and, and some that are. And now if we want to change a page, um, we've run out of spare blocks. We've run out of, of freely erased blocks. So what we have to do is some housekeeping and we have to combine all of the kind of unused pages, the pages we don't want anymore into a single block so we can erase it. Um, and this is what we call garbage collection. Um, and we do a similar thing. We take all the good pages, we make a note of them. Uh, that clears some space. We can erase those blocks. We can write them back and now we've got a new page. Um, and in this scenario, we uh, we wanted to write 28 pages, but in order to do that, we wrote 37. So we've still got a kind of write amplification factor, but it's much better. It's one point something instead of nine as it was before. Um, so that's roughly how NAN works. Um, but where does it go wrong? Well, if we take an actual photo of a NAND, uh, this is uh, a NAND floating gate cell, uh, I think from the 90s, an AMD flash. Um, you can clearly see the kind of end channel um, going into the source and drain on the sides, the kind of mottled uh, P layer. Uh, you can see a really thin kind of um, lighter colored, the oxide layer um, and uh, another one above that. And you have the floating gate and the control gate above that. Um, but what happens is the electrons that are stored on that floating gate, they do have a habit of leaking out and disappearing. Um, and that's not ideal. And that's partly why if you have, say, a NAND chip and you put some data on it and you come back to it in 10 years, it might not all be there. Um, also, the act of erasing and programming can put stresses on the NAND cell. And in particular, um, whilst electrons get onto the floating cell and come off, they can sometimes get trapped in that oxide. Um, and the effect of losing or gaining electrons in this way affect that threshold voltage. Um, and that's kind of okay because you can lose some electrons and, and that's fine. But as manufacturers try to put many more bits of data on a single cell, the kind of margins of error get smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, here's an example of um, TLC flash where you have three bits of data per cell. Um, 
And obviously, you know, a few electrons makes a bigger difference in that case, and you might misread it as being 101 instead of 100. Um, so for this reason, and mainly due to the oxide where um, NAND flash has a limited life, and uh, the figures might look like SLC NAND, where you have one bit per NAND cell, you might get around uh, 10,000 uh, as a minimum programming ray cycles. With MLC, it might be 3,000, and with TLC, it might be 1,000. Um, so the first thing we need to do is make sure that, obviously, we, we use those NAND cells evenly, and with the kind of approach we described, where you use like a log-based type of um, process, um, when you select a block to write to, you pick one that hasn't had much wear. Um, and by doing that, you can try to spread the wear um, across your device. The other interesting thing about NAND is that because these NAND cells are all in a string connected in series, if you want to sample the data on one of those transistors, you have to turn on all the others in the string. And you do that by applying a much larger voltage. Um, but every time you apply voltage to the NAND, you're effectively increasing the chances of electrons jumping onto that floating gate. Um, so over time, with lots of reads, you get this read disturb issue where uh, another floating gate somewhere else, its data might change. Likewise, as, NAND, uh, as manufacturers are making NAND cells smaller and smaller, they get closer and closer together, and you kind of get this kind of cross-coupling cross effect. So when you erase one cell, you might uh, affect the value in another. To some extent, uh, ECC can be used to mitigate this. And if you look at the organization of NAND flash, you get like a, a main data area and you get this extra out of band area where you can use to store ECC values. Um, and if you look at any NAND data sheet, you'll get um, some description on the kind of required um, ECC um, requirements that are needed to achieve the reliability that the manufacturer claims. So as you can see now, um, the firmware in that microprocessor on the, on the microcontroller on the SD card is really important. It has to do things like ECC, has to manage wear leveling, a flash transla translation layer, garbage collection, and all these kind of things. Um, its goal is to present a nice, friendly block interface that we all like to use. Um, but it's a complete black box, and you've got absolutely no idea what happens. Um, and it's kind of beyond the, behind the veil of uh, SD card manufacturers. Um, but despite trying to present this uniform interface, um, some performance characteristics uh, still can be seen. And what I've got here is a graph of four SD cards, and I've measured the, um, the, the throughput, the speed of, um, of a throughput when you write to the SD cards at different block sizes. And in all cases, the larger the block size you write, the, the faster the performance of the card. Um, also, generally, you tend to find that sequ sequential access is much better than um, random access. Um, so the point here is that even though you get a kind of a uniform block-based interface, it's not very uniform behind the scenes and performance characteristics demonstrate that. Um, so what we thought would be really cool to do is to take a, a kind of consumer SD card and write to it as much as we can to see how it fails. Um, so we thought we'd see firstly how long it takes to break, um, how it breaks, and how our kind of write access patterns can, can adjust that time. Uh, so we started off with some Transcend 8 gig SD cards. Um, they say on the packaging it's MLC flash, so we have some idea on what to expect. Um, we set up one of these um, uh, Raspberry Pi clusters. They have um, four Pico 02s on them. Each one's got an SD card, um, so uh, we can run a test on each, each, on each SD card. We also found these uh, quite interesting micro SD to SD uh, adapters, so we can also use full size SD cards if we wanted to. Um, on those um, Pies, we used a uh, software called FIO. It's uh, um, open source uh, software that allows you to perform IO workloads. And what we did is we, we set it up so it would write the entire contents of the SD cards over and over and over again um, at the block layer, not at the file system layer, literally at the block layer. Um, we did this differently for each card. So we had a test where we write in half megabyte blocks in a sequential fashion from beginning to end. And we also used variant block sizes, um, but in a random fashion. And with FIO, you can tell it to write, to pick a random block, but, pick, but use each block only once. Um, and of course, we captured all the logs so we could, we could figure out what happens when it goes wrong. Um, we had to go estimate in the life, um, how long we thought this would last for. Um, we've got an 8 gig SD card. Um, we know that MLC 
should be able to do around 3,000 programming array cycles. So you could make the assumption that if we write to the, the entire card once, then we've probably programmed and erased each MLC NAND cell at least once. So if you multiply the two together, we should, we, we felt that we would get around 21 terabytes before things start going wrong. Um, and this TBW metric is a metric you might be familiar with um, that aims to describe the life of um, something that has flash memory in it. Um, it's also worth noting that if you look at the kind of um, manufacturer's product information, they do express uh, kind of endurance or lifetime in different ways. Uh, the card we've got is one on the left on the top, and there's no information about its endurance other than its MLC flash. Um, but you often get uh, endurance measured in terms of the application use. So on the top right is an example of how much video you can store. And obviously, that's uh, from a kind of file system application specific way. Um, and at the bottom, you can see sometimes they have expressed a figure um, in TBW. And some also just talk about the um, number of cycles the actual underlying flash can do. Um, so then we set it up, and then we waited. Um, and this wait was really painful. And this is where all the fear, uncertainty, and doubt kicked in, where you question everything you've done. And, you, uh, and in fact, what we did here is we ended up with three clusters. Um, and we initially started off with 32 gig cards. And when they weren't failing quick enough, we switched to uh, eight gig cards. When they weren't failing, we switched to two gig cards. And we changed the test each time. But it was a really good learning process. And we learned a great deal from doing this on how to do this type of testing. Um, but anyway, eventually, enough cards failed. And we were able to produce this really beautiful graph. Um, now, what you can see is along the, the x-axis on the bottom is the amount of data we were able to write to the card before it failed. Um, and where you see the kind of dotted line, that's the point where it failed. And then along the y-axis, um, you can see the, the throughput, the how quickly we could write to the card for the given access patterns. Um, and the black line in the middle is our 21 TBW expectation for how long it would last. Um, and by the way, this whole, the whole graph is about three months. Um, and actually, the, the red line, which represents the sequential 512k um, write, is actually still going, <laughs> much to my frustration. And in fact, I can see if it's still going now. And as you can see, it's, it's still happily going along. Um, so I've been monitoring this thing on my phone and um, all the time. Um, but I think this slide is really important because it shows that even though an SD card looks like a uniform block in space, how you write to it will affect both the performance and its endurance. And you can see that where you use uh, sequential access, that's better than random. It lasts longer and it's faster. And also, um, when you use smaller block sizes, um, it's slower and doesn't last longer. And in my view, um, the, the reason for the latency or the difference in, in, in speed is because when you give a command to an SD card, it has to do some work. And the things that take time are programming and erasing. So if it takes longer because it's doing write amplification and garbage collection, then all that time is using those program erase cycles. Um, and you see that in terms of a reduction in uh, throughput and uh, you go through those cycles quicker. Um, so how did it fail? Um, well, firstly, before it failed on at least three of those cards, we saw some CRC errors in, in FIO, um, which is interesting because it means that the error wasn't detected anywhere. And it came to the application, and the application's like, something's gone wrong here. But if this wasn't FIO, and it was a file system, this is probably where you get corruption. Um, and these didn't happen immediately before they failed. They happened sometime before. Um, so that was really interesting. Um, but when things did go wrong, we would get these um, 110 timer errors, where a command is sent to the SD card, and the SD card's just like, sorry, can't do anything here. Um, sometimes you would get these intermittently, and things would carry on working, and sometimes they would fail continuously. Um, and when they did fail, we'd get a kind of an I/O error, a kind of user space. Um, sometimes we'd get these kind of um, previous commands, never completed errors. Um, and when we realised that an SD card wasn't ever going to work again, we uh, we pulled it out or re rebooted the, the the cluster. And what we'd find is again we'd get the minus. 110, I'm not responding, error. Um, and in some cases, it would detect the capacity of the card, and we'd get a device node, but every time we read and write to that device node, we'd get an error. Um, and sometimes it wouldn't detect the card at all, so we wouldn't get a device node. Um, 
when I did this test, and this wasn't what I expected to happen, my experience has mostly been on SanDisk SD cards, which have a, a very different kind of failure mode. Um, and what they seem to do is they seem to detect they've gone wrong, and they go into this read-only mode. But they go into a read-only mode in a way where um, the SD card must dis just ignore any write requests and say, yep, I'm done. Um, so they're effectively a read-only card, but the kernel doesn't know that. So when you write to it, you can, you can write files, you can read them back, and thanks to uh, the kernel's page cache, you're just reading from the page cache, you can either unmount it and remount it, and the data's still there. But it's only when you drop the file system caches or remove and reinsert the SD card that you realize all those changes aren't there anymore. Um, and I think it's important to understand the failure mode of your SD card, because if you're building a product and it fails in this unexpected way, it might be firstly really hard to debug, but if you know how it fails, you can detect it and you, you have a chance of doing something about it. Um, so back to our testing, um, we ended up getting around 40 terabytes written on the uh, sequential 512k test. Um, and uh, if you turn that into programming array cycles, it's you know, nearly 6,000. And that would assume that there's no right amplification at, at uh, sequential 512k, which that might not be true. Uh, but from that, you can kind of deduce get some sense of the right amplification for the different access sizes. And you can see that the smaller the, the right size, the, the worse the amplification is. Um, I wanted to try and describe why smaller block sizes gives you worse amplification. Um, and the best way I could come up with this is if you imagine kind of a mostly uh, full card um, where you have kind of free blocks that aren't used, they'll probably be you know, evenly distributed on the card. And so you in the case here where we're writing at, say, the top line where we're writing at, say, one page at a time, then you need to bring four of those together before you have enough, um, enough to create a new block. Uh, whereas when you, you write two blocks at a time, you only need to combine two blocks. Um, so the question is, what can you do given this knowledge? Um, well, the first thing you need to do is you need to not write or read the SD card if you don't need to. You need to remove any unnecessary reading and writing. Um, this will reduce the, the wear, but it will also improve performance. Um, and what's really easy to do is use the block layer statistics. Uh, if you cat proc disk stats, for example, for every block device, the kernel keeps a track of um, how much data has been written. And you can sample that and you can see, oh, that's a surprise. And if it is, you can try and optimize that out by using things like block trace. Um, and the type of activities you might do uh, might be to remove unnecessary login, um, to maybe use a read-only file system, um, and maybe turn off kind of record and access times of files. Um, in order to reduce a write amplification, we obviously prefer um, using larger block sizes. Um, and again, with the block layer statistics, um, the two statistics that are of interest are the right sectors, the amount of data you've written, and the number of I.O. requests. And if you divide one by the other, you can get the kind of average uh, right size. Um, and you want that figure to be as high as possible. But when you know your average right size, it's really hard to do anything about it um, because the path through the kernel is complex and the kernel does a great job of, of abstracting that away and, and you know, doing the best it can for you. Um, and typically when you application writes somewhere, um, it writes to a file system and any of those changes sits in the page caches. Um, and then at some point in the future, the kernel decides um, how and when to write those dirty pages out. Um, at this point, um, the block layer um, and the IO scheduler can uh, do some magic in kind of combining um, write requests so that JSON write requests become bigger and they can reorder them as needed. Um, but the point here is that the, the kind of I.O. access pattern at the, the block layer will be very different from that of your application. Um, it's also worth looking at the, your file system. Um, and what we found, a, a quick win for one customer was, um, if you're using, say, XFAT or FAT, um, you have a, a, a cluster size. And that's the kind of minimum granularity of size that the file system writes. So if you increase that, then your average block size that you write is going to be bigger. And that can make a massive difference. Um, and it's really easy to do. Um, we spent a lot of time looking at IO schedulers and, and the kind of fairest tunables. Um, we had some good success with MQ deadline. Um, and the particular issue we had was we, we had a device that records video streams. And, and there was multiple processes. And what we wanted the kernel to do is we wanted it to, to 
we wanted it to uh, merge adjacent rights, but we needed the kernel to hold on to that data for long enough so there was something to merge with. Um, and we found that using the MQ deadline and setting the parameter N R requests it says to the kernel, look, you could have some more time. You know, the latency of the right isn't that important to us, but we just want um, you to have the best chance of combining rights. Um, obviously, if you're using direct I.O. in your application or using things like sync, well, that'll impact the kernel's ability to optimize things for you. Um, one thing that's really interesting, I haven't actually tried this, but if you use block trace to um, capture I.O. traffic from your application, um, you can actually use F.I.O. to replay that. So if you're trying to iterate and make some changes, what you can do is you can um, run your application, uh, record a block trace uh, log, and then you can ask FIO to play it back really quickly. And then you can make some changes and you can see how those changes affect it with, with a reproducible workload. Um, the other thing that's really interesting is um, we looked at the garbage collection earlier on and a lot of the reason for the right amplification was that the SD card controller is having to move around blocks of data that it thinks you need to keep. Um, but in many cases, that might not be true. Um, so if you delete a file in the file system, um, the, the NANs and the SD card controller has no idea if you deleted that file. Um, and that's a problem because there's data on the, the NAND flash that's being preserved that doesn't need to be preserved, and that's causing my amplification. Um, but a lot of file systems have like the discard uh, property, and if you do that, uh, when you delete files and when areas of, of the, the, the block device aren't used, um, it gives that information to the SD card controller and it can mark that as something it doesn't need to keep. Um, the other thing that's interesting is um, the amount of life you have in an SD card is really about the amount of NAND it has. Thanks to wear leveling, the larger um, the SD card, the longer it will last. Um, so an easy win is always to buy a bigger card uh, or look for one that has a higher TPW. Um, and also, you know, if, if you don't need all that space, you don't need to use it, but you'll still get a benefit because of the wear leveling. Um, it's probably worth speaking to the SD card manufacturers because they have a lot more information on how their controllers work. Um, and they actually, uh, in many cases, there they are commands that you can issue that you can directly ask the SD card, how much life do you have left? Um, and they have a wide range of things that's probably worth exploring. Uh, in terms of performance, um, what we found was um, if you use IO stat, you can look at the average write size and you want that to be as high as possible. But what we find is when that's low, the SD card becomes a bit of a bottleneck. And as a result of that, utilization goes to close to 100, meaning that uh, the SD card is, driver is being used all of the time. Um, but the side effect of that can be um, the dirty pages in the kernel builds up to a point and then the kernel says, hang on a minute, you know, you're producing dirty pages quicker than we can get rid of them. So the kernel will actually effectively throttle your application or use your application to write out those pages um, and you get high I.O. weight. Um, so it's useful to look at I.O. stat and aim for a low utilization, a high average write size, and then you'll find that your average throughput goes up. Um, and one of the last points I want to make is um, if you look at SD cards, um, SD card specification has a number of um, performance classes. You might often see the C10 or the 10 in the circle, um, and you get various video classes. Um, and if you look at the SD card specification, which is, is, is publicly available, um, you'll actually find that many of the video classes uh, make very specific assumptions about what needs to happen in order to get that kind of certification. Um, they can include things like using a specific file system, most generally always assumes fat, it assumes a certain write size, normally 512K. Um, it assumes, um, in the case of the video classes, it assumes that the kernel will actually issue commands. Uh, there's one that's, I think, like video class start mode, and the kernel just doesn't support these. So um, if you buy uh, an SD card that says V30, uh, meaning the performance in write and video is not going to mean much in Linux because Linux doesn't issue those commands. Um, what's interesting as well is um, there is a, a, a performance class, you might have seen A1, um, and these seem to be geared towards kind of mobile phones, um, which is why you tend to only really see them for micro SD cards. Uh, but they, they seem to be focused on um, being able to have lots of small write sizes. So the, the kind of underlying firmware in the controller is geared for lots of small writes. Um, and actually, um, I've got a graph here. Um, 
So this is an SD card that doesn't use the kind of A profile. Um, the graph on the left is a brand new card, um, but that's not really representative because uh, it, it, it's, um, there's no garbage collection going on because there's loads of free blocks. Uh, but the right side is once you've used it for a bit. And you'll see that on a normal SD card, the um, sequential access is really fast and the random access is really slow. But if you use an A1 card, you'll find it's very different. Uh, and the point here is that the firmware on that card can really have an impact on the performance. So finding a card that meets your needs is, is really useful. Um, finally, we thought it'd be useful for our customers if when things go wrong with SD cards, uh, it would be nice to know how much data they've been written, what kind of a life that SD cards had. Um, so we wrote a, um, uh, an open source daemon that basically persistently logs the uh, block stats for a specific device. Um, and the idea, it's, it's really simple, uh, but the idea is that um, you can get some information. And we hope that this could be a starting point. So over time, we can add things like life estimation, or we can perhaps predict just before a card's going to fail. Um, so we put that on GitHub, and uh, any kind of input or uh, involvement would uh, really appreciate. Um, so to summarize then, um, the kind of key take home messages here is that how you use the, the, the SD card, the access patterns will really have an impact on its performance and its life. Um, sequential lar se large access is always better and quite often sequential accesses are too, but it depends on the SD card. Um, if you can always get a bigger card than you need um, because it will last longer, um, I would ignore um, kind of performance classes and measure a card yourself. Um, always kind of measure at the, the low block level layer and try and optimize at that and choose an SD card wisely. Um, so that's my talk. If you've got any questions, uh, feel free to let me know. I don't know how to turn it on. I'll leave that with you. <laughs> Thanks for the great talk. It's one. It's it's one of the most interesting one I, I attended to. Uh, I have two questions. Although the, the the second question I think I got to answer already, but I'll anyhow ask. Uh, so first one is uh, for your tests you did. Uh, did you read the? Um, I think with MMC utils you can read. I think it's called XCSD or something like that. Registers. Yeah. So um, for you EMM. Lifetime. For EMMC, you get that, and that's part of the specification, but not for SD cards. Um, it's only certain manufacturers that will have their own uh, commands that you can probe that, yeah. that information. But generally, SD cards, you don't get that. Do you know if this is really reliable, this, this, this registers? How do um, they... I, I think so, because they, they come from an understanding of the, you know, the, the firmware and the SD card. So, um, so, so certainly, if it's there, it's, it's worth yeah, relying on or, or using. Okay, and the second question is uh, really related to the evaluation of the of the lifetime of of yeah I'm interested in EMMC. I guess it's the same applies for for SD card. Uh, is it so parsing this uh, block disk stats? Yeah, so that that's applicable for any block device. So that's what Creel Counter does, or yes, yeah, uh, because the if you look at block stats, obviously if you if you reboot the machine. They go back to zero, and you want to kind of associate the block count with a specific device that maybe have a zero number. Um, and also, those counters do overflow over time, so Curl Counter deals with that too. So it, it accumulates the. Yeah. Uh, uh -huh, okay, great. Thanks. Any other questions? Yeah, two questions also, please. Um, you kind of touched on it there about using an oversight SD card, I wonder would there be an advantage, uh, did you perhaps examine it, about using a portion, just say, I don't know, 75, 80% of the SD card, leaving a portion unpartitioned? Yeah, um, so that, that's beneficial. Um, and it doesn't matter if, if it's an unpartitioned space or if you've got a file system that can, when you don't use the space, it, it you know, definitely is it. But the point is that, um, the, from the perspective of the micro uh, 
controller in, in the SD card, it wants to think those, those NAND blocks are free. Um, so obviously if it's unpartitioned um, and if it's never been written to, um, then, then that's fine. Uh, there's a command I think called block discard, uh, which is a way of saying these blocks aren't used. So obviously doing that on that kind of area would be really useful because you only have to write to that unpartitioned bit once and then the, the SD card will think that there's data in it it needs to keep. Um, so th that, that's really crucial as well, I think. Okay, thanks very much. And second question then, you mentioned about how the uh, SD card records map of which uh, kind of pages are in use. Yeah. Is that map stored on the same medium that... Um, I mean, it has to be somewhere persistently, um, but I don't know. I mean, this is uh, black magic from the, the defenders and really, you know, these to some degree guesses for the, how, how okay. it actually works. But um, I suspect there will be some storage used for, for keeping that. Okay. And if that gets corrupted, obviously, then that's the whole game, <laughs> the game over. Game over. Right. That's a really good question, actually. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, hello. Uh, did you try to use Flash, Flashbench to know whether uh, how many open AU you had on, on your no, and I, cards? No, I did look at that um, yeah. a long time ago, um, and <coughs> yeah, and I, I don't know how how relevant that is to today's NAND because I know that's quite old, isn't it? Um, so, and, and this, so the concept here is that um, if you consider an SD card controller, it, it's a microcontroller. It's got limited, you know. Uh, RAM, for example, um, and I think the view was that um, when you're doing kind of random access uh, for that kind of garbage collection and housekeeping, it does it on a certain area and it has a sense that you have these open allocation units. But then when you move over here, you have to do the housekeeping, tidy that up, and, and there some cards have more open AUs, access units that you can use. Um, but I don't know how true that is now. Um, so. Um, I didn't go too far down that road, but um, it would be really interesting if there was um, someone here that works for an SD card manufacturer or someone that could open source the firmware on the microcontroller, you know, on the SD cards would be really useful. Uh, but yeah, um, a lot of it is guesswork really. So uh, I did play with that, but I didn't really come to any fruitful conclusions. Have you looked at benchmarking retention after like exceeding the rated number of cycles for the... Um, it would be interesting to do that, but my experience of doing this is things take a really long time, so um, I don't know. It's interesting, actually. I've seen graphs from vendors where you kind of get a graph that shows retention, and the retention depends on not only the wear of that individual NAND cell, but also the temperature as well. Um, it would be interesting to do that, but uh, I've not had a, a reason to do that yet. So you're tested about how long does it I mean, are you reading back and verifying exactly what's there? What, in these tests? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's what we do. So FIO, we Just configure. immediately right after then. Uh, so we, uh, there's some options in FIO. And what we didn't want to do is read it back straight away in case the SD card has some kind of cache on it. Um, so I think we told it to wait like at least 100 megabytes before it starts reading it back. So we read back everything that we wrote, um, but not necessarily straight away. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Yeah, so have we done any tests where the flash itself was subjected to a higher temperature and then see if it wears out faster that way or it affects it? Um, I haven't, um, but I think it would. Um, mm -hmm. but, uh, but yes, no, I've mm -hmm. not done that. that would or maybe be a colder temperature would make it more resistant or things like that. I, I think so, yeah. I, think mm -hmm. that's just, I, I guess generally the, the higher temperature things have more energy and they can move about more Got than, it. than escape, yeah. I've got a question at the back if we get the microphone over there. Uh, yeah, I, the graph that you showed halfway through, showing your results, there were some changes in oh. throughput, like at different sections for at least two of the lines, and I was just wondering what that is. You see it on the yellow and red Yeah, lines. I've, I've seen this on other tests and I've done. It's like this kind of bimodal thing, and I haven't come up with a good explanation. And the thing you have to remember is each one of those dots isn't a single read. It's a read of an entire SD card. So that's, that's like... Um, a, a change in, in throughput over quite a long period of time. Um, I could only come up with guesses, so I, I didn't make any comments. I mean, it's possible that SD cards improve performance by having multiple flash dies, and 
the performance of each die might be slightly different. So maybe generally you've got a mix from the two, but occasionally you use the slower one more often. Uh, but it's weird how it goes down, it stays down, and it goes up. Um, the other thoughts were it could be related to the kind of garbage collection and it's kind of got into a bit of a state where it's having to keep doing the same thing over again and then it kind of recovers from that and then it's more efficient. Um, that's probably the most likely one. Um, the other th really interesting thing I found, I, I found about this graph was on each, on each case you see, particularly with the slower ones, you see uh, a slight degradation in performance um, for, for each of them, but the sequential one you get an increase in performance. And I think the reason why is that when as when NAND cells wear out, um, erases take longer, but programs are quicker. So I think when you're doing more erases because you've got the amplification, um, you see that in reduction in throughput. But for the sequential mode where you're mostly in programs, you, you see that. It's, it's, it's just a theory, but um, it would have been interesting to do the same test, but um, with an actual NAND chip. <laughs> Um, and then you could measure this stuff on the scope a lot more. Uh, but I thought it'd be useful to do it from Linux as well because that's how you use it and come across these issues. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you, everybody. Thank you.